Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, Francesco. Hi, Hi Sheer. Good nice to see you. you. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to give people maybe a minute to trickle in. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to a talk to our talk today about global India. Yeah, I see people are joining in mm -hmm. and we'll share sort of the rules of engagement uh, for, for this uh, Zoom webinar in just a minute as a reminder. It's good to see so many people joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So welcome. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is uh, Zooming In, our bi-weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm Shir Gal Kochavi, and joining me is Francesca Spaniolo. Hello. Hi. Hello Hi. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, all our participants have their cameras turned off, but we invite you, as always, to interact with us in two ways. If you have any technical difficulties or technical questions, please use the chat button on the bottom of your screens. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button also on the bottom of your screens. We'll be presenting for approximately 20 minutes and plan to leave a few minutes in the end to answer any questions that you might have. Throughout the coming few talks uh, and the past three talks that we had, we're reflecting on exhibitions presented at the Magnus over the last decade highlighting how they're going to be revisited in the context of Time Capsules, a new exhibition that we're hoping to open in the fall. Just as a reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish uh, museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. So to start us off today, and without further ado, we'll be talking about the exhibition called Global India an exhibition curated by Francesco, and he'll tell us more about it in a, in a moment, in 2013. Um, in the last two talks, we were talking about exhibitions that were based on different collaborations with scholars and students, but as Francesco hopefully will soon tell us and share with us, uh, this the background for this exhibition was slightly different. So let's dive in, Francesco, if you're ready. I am ready, thank you. I like to be called to order. Thank you, Shir. Uh, keep me honest. Uh, so yes, as you were saying, we're, we're basically revisiting in public a, a series of exhibitions that were presented by the Magnus in the, over the last decade. Uh, and we'll be including these exhibitions in an upcoming show. As, as you were saying, we're hoping to open it uh, in uh, September, uh, reopening the galleries of the Magnus to the public. and. Uh, uh, the UC Berkeley campus is uh, moving towards uh, in-person teaching and so on. So we're, we're ever so hopeful that everything will go smoothly towards that. Uh, the exhibition we'll be presenting is called Time Capsules and we'll highlight 10 exhibitions presented over 10 years. In 2013, we presented Global India, Kerala, Israel, Berkeley. And it's an exhibition that was essentially an outcome of a major collection survey. So. We, as you were saying, we're talked about um, bringing in scholars, uh, artists, uh, students, and researching the collection with them. In this case, it was really the, the originating uh, impetus was really a collection survey. Uh, the Magnus brought uh, to Berkeley and received from the Jewish community in Kerala in beginning in the late 1960s and into the early 80s, a whole variety of I, we've calculated circa 1500 items from South India, from Kerala. The slide before actually had a, a map so that we know what exactly what we're talking about. Uh, if, you, if you go back, even though we call the exhibition Global India, the focus was Kerala. We see it highlighted in the, in the, in the big map of India, the small big map of, map of India and uh, on the top left of the screen. And then uh, the bigger map shows the area of Kochi in Kerala where most of the Jewish settlements uh, are still uh, visible today. And so from this whole area, um, about 1,500 objects came to the Magnus and were brought in. And it was a very interesting collecting process. A partner, it was a partnership between the founder of the Magnus, the late Seymour Fromer, and uh, Rabbi Bernard Kimmel. Bernard Kimmel had served as a rabbi facilitating the Aliyah, the immigration to Israel, 
of the bulk of the Kerala community since the 1950s. So he was connected with the community, had a, an idea about who was still there and, and what kind of uh, items were likely being left behind. And so what happened is that the Magnus received, a, a, you know, synagogue furnishings and lamps. We'll see some of these. We'll have a gallery and I like of this towards the end of our talk. A variety of ritual objects, textiles, including especially festive clothing, uh, which are color coded for different festivities, you know, whether it's weddings, life cycle events, or, or the high holidays and so on. Very fascinating manuscripts. Um, and books, including books that were collected there and some of the manuscripts, but were actually brought to India in the various waves of migration. So it's an interesting slice of, of, of uh, Jewish life in India in the last couple of centuries. And also, as we will see, photographs and film footage that were actually collected not by the Magnus, but by, UC, by, by a professor who eventually was a professor at UC Berkeley, who, who visited Caroline in 1937. So in 1937, so we'll, we'll, we'll see a little bit today of all of these materials. And, and uh, yeah. Let's think about why global India for, for mm -hmm. a second. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I remember I was exposed to the traditional lore of the Kochi Jewish community in Israel uh, when I was living there. And uh, especially through a major initiative that was run by both the Hebrew University and the Ben Svi Institute at the time. So we're talking about roughly 20 years ago, uh, including a revival of uh, Kochi uh, women's songs uh, in Malayalam, which is the language, the, the dominant language in the region. And so that's how I started learning about this. And remember kind of confronting the general communal perception of, oh, look, there are Jews in India, what, a, what an exotic thing to actually learning about the history and the culture of this community and realizing that for at least a thousand years, but maybe a lot longer, this is a small community that was globally connected to the rest of the Jewish diaspora and beyond, mostly because the community was situated at the, at the head of the uh, spice trade uh, which was very active in the early modern period and all the way to the present. You know, people like to be reminded that when in America, when people actually when go to, when they go to Italian restaurants, they're often and it's 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 a feature of Italian restaurants. And uh, this is the Italian in me speaking, of course. Italian restaurants in America, they will offer it to sprinkle pepper. They use a long, uh, which Italy Italian don't really use a long uh, uh, pepper mill. And typically the black pepper there comes from Kerala, just as, a, as an idea and as the fact that to this day we're impacted by, by the spice trade uh, that uh, really took the world over uh, for, for centuries. So Kochi is situated right there and in a way at the center of the world. So the idea of being globally connected was I think co-essential to the history and the culture of this community. The other um, thought that we had in, in planning this exhibition was uh, the subtitle, Kerala, Israel, Berkeley. And we'll talk about that too. There are reasons for that. But uh, the Magnus probably has the largest group of materials from this community anywhere in the world. And so it's an important collection that we wanted to bring forth. Uh, the impetus to collect started when uh, in uh, 1967, 68, the state of Kerala, where Kochi is located, um, moved towards celebrating the 400th anniversary of the Paradeji Synagogue in, in the city of Kochi, uh, which was located very close to a royal palace. We see here a photo by David Mandelbaum, an anthropologist who taught at UC Berkeley, bought these photographs with him. And uh, some of these are actually at the Magnus, other photographs are at the Bancroft Library, part of the university archives. And so we see a photograph from 1937 and then a poster from 1967-68 that was used in the celebrations of this community. These celebrations were international in nature. They brought in scholars and um, various uh, public figures from all over the world to, to celebrate the 400th anniversary, 400th anniversary of the synagogue. And uh, the state of Kerala even printed stamps to commemorate this. So it was, it was actually a big deal and an important moment in rediscovering the history of this uh, crucial Jewish community. Uh, so this is a, a yes, this is a, a postal stamp and, 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 the, and the letterhead that was presented. Over the years, uh, research has been done in 
rediscovering, and actually a, a key figure in this research is uh, located very close to us in Palo Alto, Mariam Sofer, um, uh, who's been spearheading a lot of activities in rediscovering the synagogues. And this is a map of the synagogues in, in, in the area. Um, and uh, books have been published. There, is, there are wonderful websites devoted to, to this. So one can actually rediscover the sites. There are many Jewish sites in Kerala, especially synagogues. Uh, but the people all moved to Israel in the 1950s. It was not a very large community. They all left, and we'll learn a bit about how they did it uh, in a minute, but they all left, and so the people are in, mostly in Israel, and most of the artifacts are in Berkeley, hence the globality also of the collection and thinking about this. So we have sites in India, people in Israel, and objects like the one we're looking at at Berkeley. This is probably the most striking um, example of what's in the Magnus collection. It's 13 foot high teak painted Torah ark from one synagogue also in, uh, in Matancheri, so in, in, the, in the center of the urban uh, area of Kochi. Um, and a synagogue that was eventually dismantled, destroyed to make room for the home of a community member. And the, the Torah Ark and a few other items were stored in the, in the back of another synagogue in Anakulam nearby. And they were eventually crated up and shipped off to Berkeley in uh, around 67 or 68. Other, another very important uh, Torah Ark is at the Israel Museum. You know this very well, Shir, right? Yes, uh, it's a great example also of the whole glo global uh, concept behind this community and the, and the movement and uh, migration of this community. And yeah. like you said, and we'll get back to it, uh, this mm -hmm. is one very good example of the type of objects that we also have mm -hmm. in Israel. Yeah. And as a reminder, in our talk today, we're very much focusing on the Kerala Jewish community because the Magnus mostly collected materials there. So we're really focusing on our exhibition, which was collection based. And uh, there are a few other items in the in, in the in the Magnus collection that are from other other very important areas of of India where Jews settled, uh, Kolkata, uh, Mumbai, very different stories. So today we're really focusing on Kerala and no pretension to to cover the entire subcontinent. It's uh, that will be a tall order for for a 20 minute talk today. Uh, this is a detail of, of the of the Torah Ark at the Magnus. Uh, and uh, it's beautifully decorated. The style was uh, pioneered in the Pardeji synagogue and then imitated by nearby synagogues. And then in doing this research and the collection survey, we realized that this pediment, you see it in the, in the top right of the slide, which is in, it was in storage at the Magnus, was actually coming also from the same area, from the same synagogue. And a photograph, 1937 photograph by David Mandelbaum, we see it on the left, shows it as a pediment at the entrance of that synagogue that was destroyed. And then he took also other photographs just outside the, the synagogue. So we also see uh, Torah cases and people just standing nearby at the entrance. And before we move forward, we have this short video we wanted to show you, uh, also taken by, by David Mendelbaum of the community. So we'll just devote a minute to show you a bit of that. So this is, of course, a silent film from 1937 that an American anthropologist, David Mandelbaum, took showing street life. And as we will see a little bit of ritual life, there is a, a, a processional a, a processional with uh, Torah scrolls, but also members of the community. And uh, it's fascinating footage that has tens of thousands of views on YouTube since we posted it there. It was a collaboration with the Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley to make this footage available. Here is the processional. And it's fascinating, this video, since it was posted on YouTube, has comments from all over the world in multiple languages and scripts. It's a, this is a narrative that really engages a lot of people from all over the world. And we're very fortunate, the Magnus, that we can share these materials. And we'll see a few of them in just a couple minutes. But this is before, before we do, um, I'd like to ask you, Francesco, to dig a little deeper and tell us a little more about the Jewish community in Kochi and the leader of the community. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more of an expert of the holdings of the Magnus than on the history True. of the Jewish community in, in Kochi. But when we were preparing this uh, work, we brought in a variety of collaborators. Uh, so um, 
I've, I've been a learner since. And uh, a key component of the collection is, are actually the diaries of Abram Barak or Baruch Salem, uh, who was a, a Kochi uh, lawyer, political activist, active both on the, on this at state level and very much in, a nationalist in, in Indian terms, uh, but also very active within internal Jewish uh, communal politics. He was an advocate for the minority group in the, in the community and for rights, equal rights for, for all. So he was contrasting this tagline of white Jews that the Paradeji community had acquired for centuries. And um, in a way, rethinking the whole narrative of the, of the history of the community at that time, he facilitated the immigration of, of the Kochi Jews to, to Israel, but he himself did not move to Israel. He stayed in until the end of his life in Kerala. Uh, his wife was a doctor, he was a lawyer. Uh, we see here, it's in the Magnus collection, their ketubah, their marriage contract. Uh, they were married in Kolkata where they were both studying and getting their degrees. And uh, they were photographed by, by David Mandelbaum in 1937, so, so 20 years later. Uh, they were photographed in, in, in Kochi. So we see A.B. Salem in the, in the photographs. And he, this is just some materials from the collection documenting the white Jews, which he, it, and, and he was contrasting the, the inner dynamic there. It's a, it's a very fascinating topic and, and a very complex one. The, the, this nomenclature of white Jews was then expanded by German and their American scol scholars into black Jews, even brown Jews. Uh, but the color coding was, seems to have been mostly a scholarly uh, construct over the reality of life there. However, these various uh, separations within the community did reflect the very complex migration history of this community. As a reminder, there are legends that go back 2000 years. There are historical records that document Jewish presence in the area for the last thousand years. They date from the year 1000. And Jews immigrated there. There are clear links with Yemen and the Arabian Peninsula. There are also obvious links with Palestine uh, over, over the centuries and then an important migration, important migrations that followed colonial routes. So first of all, Portuguese, and then European, uh, eventually under British rule, but there were Ashkenazi Jews that moved to Kerala as early as the 16th century. Uh, so we, it's really a complex and globally connected community and um, a very multi-layered. And, uh, as, uh, and this is an example also of Abram Salem's diaries. Thank you for bringing it up, Shir. Uh, the Magnus has, is, is, so his, his children, his two children donated these diaries to the Magnus uh, at the time. These are, this is a page from, from 1937. It's uh, diaries that he kept year after year and it's quite well documented. We started digitizing these just before the pandemic and we hope to continue. It, it required a small team of people that couldn't meet in person uh, last semester, last year actually, but uh, we hope to continue soon. Uh, so this is, uh, again, uh, some of the unique uh, materials. I think this is the page actually that documents the visit by anthropologist David Mandelbaum in, uh, in September during the high holidays of 1937. So uh, it's, uh, it's a way to kind of bring all of our various sources. So uh, it's a beautiful together. example for our holdings, which really opens up the next portion of our presentation as well to kind of think about the importance of, our, of the holdings of the Magnus and and the important place that they take in the context of a museum and serving as a repository, repository or as a safe place to save materials and continue researching them for this communal effort. Yeah, well, it, what, what happened is that uh, um, Seymour Frommer with um, Bernard Kimmel and others, he, it's, Seymour was in, in, con, in contact with David Mandelbaum in Berkeley and uh, Professor Fischel and others who, who really shaped up this collecting effort. And it was a, a collecting effort that went, as I was saying, went on for uh, a little over a decade, since the late 60s and through the, uh, through the early 80s. And various materials were acquired either directly in Kerala uh, from Bernard Kimmel, who brought artifacts to the United States. And also, and we found letters documenting this, uh, some of the more striking items, the Torah Ark, the book collection, the, the diaries of A.B. Salem were really donated by the last members of the community 
there in the in the 60s and 70s and shipped off to Berkeley. So as you were saying, it's really it was really a communal archiving project in a way. And uh, and the, the Magnus served as the repository for this. It took several dec decades to sort through all these materials. When we started doing the collection survey, we realized that a lot of the Kerala items had not been fully identified as Kerala items. So we, that's when we needed to bring in colleagues and experts who can, could help us uh, tell them apart from other items. So we've learned a lot in the process. This is one another striking example. It's most likely a Ner Tamid, a, 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 a lamp, a synagogue lamp. It has very interesting inscriptions in Malayalam by the maker of the lamp, in Hebrew as a, a honoring the, the, the donors. And so we have, and there is also dates. So we, we see this, uh, this item as an example of partnership and collaboration between Jews and non-Jews in the area. Um, and uh, it's, it's a fascinating history. These are synagogue lamps. Uh, I believe the one on the left is one, is one that has an inscription, a historical inscription that uh, documents the visit of a, of a British army uh, officer to, to, uh, to Kerala, which is also documented in historical sources. But in a way, this is also to show that an object like a synagogue lamp can become a historical source um, in its own right. Um, unique shapes, unique features of uh, ritual objects. This is a Hanukkah lamp um, with a beautiful uh, parrot uh, on the on the servitor. So we, we see and on on each of the of the oil the, the holders of the whole wells um, as a way to, to well we'll we'll see parrots again. They're they're very ubiquitous in 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 the in the artifacts from Kerala. Two different and strikingly different examples of of mezuzot the 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 boxes that go on doorposts. The one on the right is really has really political connotations. Um, six pointed stars emerge in the in the lore of of, of the Jewish communities in in, in the area um, after 1917, after the Balfour Declaration, and sort of the 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 uh, the time in which the various Jewish communities of the British Commonwealth were hit by the wave of Zionism. So that's really the infancy. Of Zionism in the Indian subcontinent, a project that will continue in Kerala through the 1950s. As I was saying, when the when the community, almost the entire community, migrated uh, to to Israel. And from that moment up onwards, we really see a lot of these six pointed stars on ritual objects, whether the synagogue objects or Hanukkah lamps or any many of the items in our collection show that. We didn't bring a lot of examples for the talk today, but. You can find it by also browsing online on our online database, and I invite you to do that. As I was saying earlier, textiles, these are various vests, and uh, we see on the left a, 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 a color coded for, for, uh, for life cycle events, and on the right for, for the yearly cycle of, of festivals and holidays, Jewish holidays. And uh, many of the materials that came to the Magnus date from the 19th, 20th century. Uh, manuscripts especially are relatively recent. As we will see, the, the weather on, on, uh, in, in Kerala uh, burnt the ink, the ink on the pages. So a lot of manuscripts were not being able to be preserved. There are also books that were printed in India. In this case, this is a book that was printed in Mumbai for the Jewish community in, uh, in uh, Kerala that did not have its own Hebrew printing press. And, uh, and, but it was specifically for uh, the ritual of the circumcision of the Brit Mila, which in Kerala had a, such a particular significance that we found manuscript testimonies of Jews from Mumbai wanting to have their babies uh, circumcised in Kerala. There was, there was something going on there uh, for sure around that. Uh, this is one of the most striking um, uh, objects, I would say. Uh, also, a manuscript, of course, in the in the in the collection of the Magnus, it's a it's an accounting book uh, from the 18th century of a spice trader. So we we see names of spices, accounting, and all kinds of materials, and and uh, and we see dates. And somebody actually uh, in the you can probably point to it, but in the middle of the page on the right, calculated dates and trans transliterated it in Roman. Yes. Uh, in, 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 in Arabic numerals, so 1742, but it goes up to the, the mid-1740s, this, uh, this record. 
And this is another beautiful example. Yeah. And we see actually front and back, the back just to show how uh, manuscripts could be reused, repurposed uh, many, many different times. Uh, yeah, an astrological chart that uh, helps pinpointing exactly what time of day under which star uh, babies are born. Um, so there is astrology there as well. Yeah. As well as amulets. Yeah, this, this has like been now published finally in an in important catalog. Um, there are similar amulets that uh, were in various collections around the world. Our dear friend and colleague William Gross in, in Tel Aviv collected almost all of them except for this one at the Magnus. I spent a lot of time deciphering all of this. We have the asset uh, published even on Flickr. People can go through it and read the whole manuscript. This was not created in India, it was brought to India and collected there. Uh, the origins, I think various scholars are still mm, uh, debating about where this uh, manuscript originated from. There are various theories around this. I believe that I'm actually reading a couple of words in Judeo-Spanish there, which would point to some kind of Mediterranean origin for this manuscript. Specifically, it's, it's, um, it's a manuscript designed to protect newborn children uh, just before the, the circumcision ceremony, the night before, and has references to lighting candles around the crib. It also has creases, which make us suspect that probably the manuscript was folded and tucked into cribs to protect. So it's a protector, it's an amulet, and, and, and a way to protect uh, children and, of course, their mothers. And we close with another striking example. Shir, what is this? This is a beautiful uh, marriage contract as. Uh... You can see it was created in 1887 for, for the wedding of, uh, of Abraham and Hannah, Rachel, Bat Abraham. And this is one of the most, I think, extravagant and most rich um, ketubas in our collection. Uh, it has gold leaf, as you can see here, and the, the depictions of lions, and of course the crown, the Torah crown on the top. And the, surrounded by the birds that we saw earlier the today, the parrots, yes, the parrots that we saw earlier today also um, on, the Han on the Hanukkiah, the Hanukkah lamp. Um, we do have a few questions. Today. Yeah, and we have a couple minutes to answer so them. So before I ask more of my questions, I think I might allow our, our listeners today to, yeah. to participate. Let's see what people are asking. So I'm, I'm, I, I can read them and address okay. a couple of them if that works for you, Shira. Yes. I know you're okay. sharing your screen. It becomes more complicated to see questions. But um, so somebody's asking where, where uh, Rabbi Kimmel, he, it, somebody's writing saying that, um, uh, I, actually I'm reading. I was at the Magnus working there in 67, 69 where the Torah Ark and other artifacts were brought in and met Rabbi Kimmel. Tell us if you can, where was the synagogue? And yes, the synagogue was, I believe he was he or it, he, he, he was based in, in Southern California at the time. Yes, that's for sure. Uh, somebody is reminding us that Professor Fischel was involved, and I think I mentioned Professor Fischel at some point, was one of the various uh, scholar activists that were involved in this collecting process. Uh, a question about the languages uh, in the area. Is there an equivalent of Yiddish or Ladino spoken in this part of the world? There is a Judeo Malayalam. Malayalam is a language spoken today and written today because Kerala has a very high uh, rate of literacy, written by about 60 million people. And Jews were part of that uh, linguistic sphere, but adapted their language also to ritual purposes. And actually, Magnus says we didn't show it today, but has a, a, a notebook, one of a few notebooks existing mm -hmm. around the world. The other ones are mostly at the Bensri Institute in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, of uh, where, where women transcribed their songs, that they were paraliturgical songs they were singing alongside the official liturgy. And there is another very good question about uh, whether European colonial authorities interacted with the Jewish community in a different way uh, than they did with other populations in the area. Um, I don't know that I'm an expert on this topic, but we do have documents that show the fact that notables on, in the British colonial uh, apparatus were visitors to the synagogues in Kerala, especially the Karadeji uh, synagogue. And, um, and I, I don't think I can answer whether they, they dealt with Jews differently from other uh, populations, but a reminder is that Kerala to this day is very proud of its multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, communities and still very much honoring the Jewish past of, of the region. So uh, 
I can see uh, all kinds of questions and about the age of the Simchat Torah vest. Um, we believe it's a 20th century vest. It's not older than that, but you can keep asking questions. We have ways of answering them. Uh, sure, you can, you can share the, our contact info. Oh, here's the vest. Thank you for yeah, Here's the vest, it. and yeah. in a minute I yeah. will also share. It actually has beautiful buttons made from coins, but one cannot see them from this photograph. One would have to come and visit the vest and the Magnus in person, and we <laughs> hope that that will be possible in the imminent future. Yep. But you can also uh, write to us if you have more questions, um, and you can also look on our, mm -hmm. um, on our digital database online. Hopefully we'll be able to digital even more once we get back to the Magnus in the fall. Mm -hmm. There is actually one last question I wanted to address oh. before we say goodbye, if that's okay, Shira. Somebody saying is writing, I'm wondering what efforts have been made to engage with the new community members, I would say Kerala Jew community members living in Israel. So effort has been made most specifically, and we should have mentioned this, with the curator of the community museum the Kerala Community Museum in Nevatim in the Negev, where there is a moshav that's in, traditionally inhabited by Jews from Kerala. And so we've been in communication over the years. We've shared as many materials as we can from, uh, from our collection with them and also brought other community members into the conversation or either by email or in person visiting the Magnus. So yes, I guess I could answer it in the positive. There is a lot more work to do. Uh, I think this exhibition from 2013 was kind of pioneering because it really exposed for the first time the public to a broad, to the broad uh, uh, um, import of the materials at the Magnus and to, took stock of them uh, in, a, in a kind of global way. So our, our exhibition was as global as the community that it originated from. Yes. Thank you, Francesco, for a fascinating talk, and we can go on, but uh, we'd like to invite you to join us in two weeks to talk about a different exhibition called Gourmet Ghettos, and we'll have a special guest who will also join us for that talk. So stay tuned, and thank you again to all of our participants, all of our listeners today, and a special thank you to Ross Calter, who has been working with us for for several months now and we're very lucky to have him with us today absolutely so thank you for your help ross and see you in two weeks yes yeah, see you in two weeks and uh and have a good weekend everybody shabbat shalom bye bye